Somebody asked me to talk about epistemology. All right. They shall have it. And epistemology is a a branch of philosophy concerned with the question of how it is possible to know anything and what is truth and questions like that. B. Epistemology is a study of natural history, two studies of natural history. B1, it is a study of how people think they know things. B2, it is a study of how people know things, which is not necessarily the same thing at all. Right. It has to do with the, how, with the word how and with the business of knowing. Right. And everybody obviously has an epistemology or they couldn't know anything. And those who say they don't have an epistemology have a lousy one. <laughs> Now, anthropology, apart from being travelers tales, becomes a critical aesthetic study of epistemology. And this object here, on the cover of a book that I did with Margaret Mead some years ago, is a, an exhibition by Margaret and Gregory of a work of art by a Bolognese, which work of art, like all other works of art, is concerned with the business of epistemology. There is a hand, and it is a hand of a witch. The witch is inside, and she's not so big, um, she actually is, that's the natural size of the hand, actually. We took the hand off the, it's a um, shadow play puppet. And we took the hand off the puppet and used it for the cover of the book and then fixed it back on the puppet again. And here is the whole puppet in the middle at the bottom of there. And it's that hand there. The puppet stands at nearly two foot six high, I guess. Uh -huh. Now, if the witch's hand is like that, you see, this in fact is a statement about how people feel witches know things. The hand is often a sense organ. It also has long fingernails which makes it into an organ of aggression of various kinds. And it's a combination of aggression and sensation and if you if that's how you know things or that's how you think somebody knows things you see this is a statement about a how of knowing okay am i stretching that too fast too far i'm not clear of the connection not clear of the connection i'm not clear <laughs> You see, there's something screwy about how that thing knows things. <laughs> and its way of knowing things becomes then a tyranny that controls everybody. Now you pass that one around. It's the middle picture in plate 22. So that a next step, for example, in epistemology is, we might ask, how is it that you have two eyes, one on each side of your nose? Uh, you grew up from a little pulpy little mass of nothing rather complicated, but with a lot of message material carried in it, called DNA, etc., and so on. And that grew and it divided and it grew and it divided. And in the course of time, it produced at one end 
you know, this thing with two eyes and a nose between and a mouth somewhat south of the nose. Uh, we could say very reasonably, how did the cells that went to make that nose and those eyes, etc., know to go into the right formations, drill procedures, to produce this effect? It's produced with quite considerable uniformity through the human population, through even a mammalian vertebral population. And, you know, some of them have an extra eye in the middle of their foreheads, but that's mythological. <laughs> um, and there are quite difficult questions involved. It isn't good enough, you know, just to say the DNA told it. Uh, you've got to say, well, now, in this world of the DNA, in which things are somehow represented so as to be turned into commands of some kind, uh, what sort of a world is that in its represented form? Uh, does it have substantives, nouns in it? Is there a word in DNA script, other words at all, uh, which might mean nose? Uh, is there another word which might mean eyes? And is there a word then which might somehow, God knows how, mean the distribution of eyes in relation to noses? And the answer is, is that it's certainly a nonsense way of talking, you know. Uh, so then, there's a sort of a jump in our thinking, which takes us into the questions of talking, not only a question of how can things be known, but how can things be communicated. And since what is communicated, since the, the message is never the thing which is communicated, I mean, there are no noses in your chromosomes, you know. There are no eyes in your chromosomes. There are presumably no relations which are the relation between eyes and noses. And what the hell is there? And how in hell do you do any of this? Well, the answer is that geneticists in principle don't know. Because they haven't asked these questions. Uh, they thought if they could find a gene or something which had to do with how many fingers, that was a gene that had to do with how many fingers, and they called it, you know, quote, five fingers, or they called it four fingers if it gave you four fingers, or they called it six fingers if it gave you six, or they called it double fingers if it gave you double fingers, and they called it brachydactyly if you didn't have the right number of joints in your fingers, and so on. But what really the message consisted of, that is something else again. So, we face a very interesting question. If I say to you, how many fingers do you have on a hand? What is your correct reply? Hmm? No. <laughs> No. <laughs> the correct reply is no. You're asking the wrong question, basically. <laughs> no is the correct answer. Uh, because it's obviously desirable that one should talk, if we're going to talk about biological things like fingers and hands and development and embryology and all that, it is desirable that we should talk a language which would somehow be isomorphic, be similar shaped to the language which the DNA talk. And if there's no word in DNA for fingers, and I'm sure there isn't, the whole thing would have to be reimagined for that to be so. Uh, and then it isn't reasonable to use a language which says, how many fingers have you? 
That's a wrong language, because it isn't the language that is being taught by the system that you're talking about, within the system. So, it's probably a little more correct to say, how many relations between pairs of fingers do you have? Or how many branchings went into making those bananas? And, well, and now, of course, we're up in, in a world where nobody knows nothing. It isn't quite clear how many branchings there are. There would seem to be four to first go, anyway. <laughs> Certainly, you know, one, two, three, four things between pairs of fingers. But then you see, it might be that the whole pentadactyl limb, you know, which is this one and that one, and the uh, limbs of newts and reptiles and things, just like it, is really a symmetrical object. In which case, this might be a single, this might then be a pair, and this then a pair, correspondingly over there then. And then you've got a rather different problem in growth control to produce it, and you've got to add on the end of it something that will skew the whole thing so that this is not symmetrical with that quite, and this not symmetrical with that, and so on. Um, at a very ancient level, the limbs are placoid scales, isn't that so? We go to the fossil fishes. Now, scales are very interesting objects, as also are feathers. Things are clearer in the matter of feathers than they are in the matter of scales, but it's the same principle. A feather, you see, is obviously bilaterally symmetrical, primarily bilateral symmetry. You've got a rachis in the middle, they call it the main stick, and then the barbs and barbules and barbulelles and whatnot coming off from it in a symmetrical way. Uh, feathers, as a matter of fact, no individual feather actually is symmetrical, as far as I know, or uh, because they are placed bilaterally on the body. So that there are feathers here and feathers here, and a feather here is the mirror image of a feather there, because they're bent. They're primarily bilaterally symmetrical with an asymmetry imposed. So that it's not too, too inconceivable that this might be a bilaterally symmetrical object within an asymmetry imposed as it is for a feather. Uh, there are some interesting things about feathers. Uh, namely, I worked with feathers of some very deviant partridges. First <laughs> creature I ever did work with, first paper I ever published. In which it turns out, these had striped feathers. And it turns out that in the scapular group of feathers, uh, I knew I'd use the blackboard. <laughs> uh, that's a bird with no feathers on. <laughs> Uh, if we start to put feathers on him, uh, they're terribly naked, actually, birds. They have feathers in a few patches, and the patches are all named like good zoological things. And there is a patch about like that there, and it has its pair on the other side there. And those are the scapular patches. There are about a hundred feathers on the scapula, on the scapula on each side, the birds I looked at. And the interesting thing is that the feathers in this patch are quite asymmetrical, 
Yes, that sort of an affair. And in these particular birds, they were striped, so that you get a, a distortion of the stripes. Uh, and what you get is a symmetry between the feathers on this side and the feathers on that side of the patch. The patch is bilateral, it's symmetrical. <coughs> on a bird, the bird, of course, being bilateral, it's symmetrical. And I'm saying this could be a bilateral symmetrical object. Um, so, the question, how many fingers have you, becomes a tricky sort of question if you push it back onto the question in terms of growth determination. How many? Is there a number? Or is there only pattern in some way? Only relations? And the whole of language, you see, becomes then a sort of distortion of epistemology in which we continually, probably, distort how the world is. You see, for describing anything, there's an infinite number of ways of skinning a cat, so to speak. But some of these ways are right and some of the ways are wrong uh, because that which you are describing is biological and was made by message systems. And you get back to this problem of how are you going to follow, be in harmony with the message system of the living creatures which are, after all, the most important things in your world, including yourself. And it would be very nice to get closer to that if we could. Now some funny things arise. Of course, all this matter of beauty and aesthetics and so on, that's all subjective, isn't it? Ah, but one of the interesting things that happens is that if you look at your hand and consider it not as a number of bananas on the end of a sort of a flexible stick, but if you consider it as a nest of relations out there, you will find that the object looks much prettier than you thought it looked. A part of the discovery of the beauty of a biological form is the discovery that in fact it is put together of relations and not put together of parts. And this means that with a correction of our epistemology you might find the world was a great deal more beautiful than you thought it was. Or you might let in the fact of its being beauty in a way that you were able to keep it out by thinking that the world was made of parts and holes. Uh, not only that, but you wouldn't be able to collect things. The whole problem of possession begins to look totally different. If what you've got to possess are multiples of relationship rather than multiples of bananas, you see. It's easy to collect multiples of bananas. You can stack them in various ways, and so on, so on, count them, tell your neighbors how many you've got, <laughs> and so on. But to say relations, I, I, I don't know how many relations go to make this rather elegant object here. You know, thousands. And relations between relations, and relations between relations between relations. <laughs> And this brings us to another aspect of biological epistemology, uh, namely that there will always be a hierarchy. I mean, relations and relations between relations, relations between relations between relations, and so on. And that opens up a whole nest of problems. Or how to talk about it. 
These are all things, you see, which nobody knows how to talk about. There is no way of talking about them. And the whole of language as we have it conceals this world, which I'm sort of opening a little bit of a crack onto so you can look in. I don't know where to go next. There are all sorts of places we could go to. We could go to the subject of psychology. Uh, there is something called role theory in psychology. Who was it was giving me a dose of role theory yesterday or the day before? They believed in it so prettily. And nice and sweet and everything. Uh, role theory, you see, is the notion, it's based on the notion that you can take one of these pretty symmetrical, double organized things, like two people, uh, slice it in half, and look at one side. You look at the relationship between two people, slice it in half, and look at the role of one of them. Now, if in fact the organization is like the organization of this poor chicken here, you see, it is really silly <laughs> to think you can understand the anatomy of a half chicken. <laughs> because you, you know, it, it's as you may say, half assed. <laughs> slice it that way. Um, and if then roles and what you're going to talk about in call it psychology or something is to be not half-assed then psychology is going to be something which involves always at least two people. In fact it's not going to be inside here it's going to be outside here. But this isn't the way psychologists talk. The basis of psycho psychological lang language was carefully exhibited by a comic um, comedian, what do they call it? I don't mean a comedian, I mean a, a writer of comedies called Moliere in the 18th century. And in the end of one of his plays, there's a sort of coda in uh, dog Latin, low-grade medieval Latin, which is an oral PhD exam between the learned doctors and the miserable candidate. <laughs> and the doctors ask the candidate in this rather horrible Latin, how is it? that opium, why is it that opium puts people to sleep? And the candidate triumphantly replies, because, learned doctors, it contains a dormitive principle. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, if you happen to have a biochemical lab, you can fractionate the opium and determine in which half of the fraction the dormitive principle resides. <laughs> and then you can fractionate it again and you can determine what sort of treatment of the opium will destroy the dormitive principle and you can devote a lifetime to studying dormitive principles <laughs> but this you see is baloney because the reason why opium puts people to sleep is not in the opium nor is it in the people but it is in a sort of fit or malfit between the opium and the people and that's how really things are and psychology, you see, believes that there's something in the people. You see, the, uh, the candidate in the Moliere oral examination could have said that people go to sleep with opium because the opium releases a dormitive tendency in the people, which is repressed otherwise, <laughs> and so on. That the opium dissolves a repressing agent which prevents the tendency, the dormitive tendency of people 
and so on and so on. Uh, this is this is you know these are all ways of talking nonsense. <laughs> And the only escape from talking nonsense is to talk about the opium and the people simultaneously. And you have to talk about the relationship between them. A fit or cross-reaction of some kind between molecules of opium and molecules of people in some form. Or pathways of molecules of people. Some, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a physiologist. Um, so the whole business of explanation comes into this business and then we get the question of how in hell in that case if Bateson you assert that all our linguistic habits are nothing but a distortion of how things are uh, how are you going to change your language so we can talk today I mean, you could, you know, put hundreds of years or dozens of years into creating a language for talking about relations, and it would still be very unsatisfactory, but at least you could talk about relations. Uh, but we want to talk about them today. And half of you here are engaged in learning stuff with a view to monkeying with human relations in some form or other. I don't know what you're going to do but to be therapists or masters or something like that, yeah? And if you're going to be therapists or masters or doctors or herbalists or something, you have to be able to deal with these relations and not with these funny sort of concealed causes that most people think in terms of. And the relations are both visible and out here. They're not even there at all. Well, what are the ways of doing that? Now, the first way, perhaps the only one, which every religious leader discovers, is the way of parables. Short, nuggety stories, each story containing a, uh, a pattern. A diagram of a pattern. So I went forth to sow, and some seed fell on good ground, some fell among, fell among um, thieves. No, it fell among thorns, not thieves. <laughs> and the birds of the air devoured it, and so on, so on. You know, the Bible is full of them, the Sufis are full of them, the Buddhists are full of them. The Hindus are full of them. The Japanese, um, what do they call them, Zen, are packed with double-edged parables. So they, they've got extra complicated parables called koan, which you can meditate on for three months. Because they have paradoxes in them. Right. So, you know, there was a story of the man who had a tame computer and he wanted to know whether computers would ever think. So he programmed the computer to solve the problem. Do you compute that you will ever think like a human being? And the computer thumped and bumped and finally printed the answer on a piece of paper as they will. And the man ran to get the piece of paper, and he read it. And on it was printed, quote, that reminds me of a story, <laughs> <laughs> Because, you see, that is in fact how people think. And it is in fact the only way in which they could think. <laughs> because there are no, no other ways of really dealing with this problem of relations in a succinct form in which all the relations that you want to think about sort of simultaneously can get into the picture together or get into the picture properly piled on top of each other so they pull on each other the right way. This is the function of stories. 
this you can do with stories. And in fact, <coughs> stories are the royal road to the study of epistemology. Now, obviously, stories don't have to be, in one sense, true in order to study epistemology. That is, the story of the sower who went forth to sow and some seed fell on good ground, etc., etc. There never was a sower, or was there? There was all a class of sowers, maybe there was, and a class of birds that ate some of the seeds that fell among stones, and a class of thorns that ate some of the seeds that fell among thorns. But there was no particular sower of whom the story of the parable of the sower was true. What was true was the relations within the story, and not the story itself. Right? So, it becomes possible, you see, to create a sort of mathematics. And this is what mathematics really is. Is a study of epistemology. The Galois groups are the best, but I don't want to get into the mathematical area because I'm not competent. Uh, you were shooting a question in. Uh, I was wondering whether you were referring to the fact that a pattern, in telling a story, there is a pattern in telling any story itself. Uh, that's where the pattern is. Always a pattern in the story. Always a pattern in your distortion of the story. What about the reality that the story pretends to tell? Is there a pattern in that? Which reality? There was never was a sower. There, there is none. There need to be one. You see, the um, I used half deliberately, half by free association, the phrase that stories are the royal road <coughs> to the discussion of relationships. Uh, I was half quoting our old friend Uncle Freud who said that the dream is the royal road to the discovery of the unconscious. Is that the phrase? Something like that. Now, uh, part of the unconscious is unconscious, you know, because language <laughs> destroys its structure. Language has the epistemology of things, and the unconscious really has to deal in the epistemology of relations. Right. So, what do we get? We get these things called dreams. What is a dream? A dream is a statement in the language of things in which the things mentioned are not the things referred to, in which you throw away the things which are the significata, the reference of the story, substitute other things, and that which is true about the dream is the formal relations contained in it. So uh, I dream about a cup on the table, and I go to my analyst and I say, oh dear, I had a dream about a cup on a table. And he hears the word, oh dear. So he knows there's something screwy about the cup on the table. <laughs> what? Well, now, what, do you, what have I given him? I've given him a relation. And he starts looking at that relation, usually without telling me what he's looking at, because that would be, you know, to fake. It'd make it too easy for me to cheat, or for him to cheat. And, well, the cup is supported on the table. So we begin to look at the problems of support. Uh, dreams are usually often interpersonal, so the support was probably interpersonal. 
and cups, well, anything in the cup. Well, I wondered whether there was milk in it. Oh, is that so? Um, <laughs> uh, and he's now got uh, me dreaming about possibly milk in a situation of support. Um, <laughs> well, you can do the rest. You know, what happens, you know, it's so good crying over spilled milk, is it? Because <laughs> my mum is a bitch, yes. <laughs> and so on. Uh, that what is carried across is not... Uh, we have a something, X, and a something, Y, and uh, some sort of a relationship between them. X contains Y, X supports Y, X feeds Y, loves Y, hates Y, pushes Y, something. And this is my dream. And the only thing about the dream that's of any interest to anybody is this in the middle. Because these things are substitute reference. And the dream, you know, in fact carries the isomorphic shape of its subject matter. But its subject matter, you see, doesn't really contain any substantives either. We think in a vulgar sort of way, when we interpret a dream, as it's called, that we take the X and Y of the dream and put in there, Daddy, <laughs> you know, and something else here. Possibly Mummy, possibly Self, uh, and so on. But that ain't so. Now, these things that we put in are still not the subject. This is the subject of the dream, for God's sake. And the stuff of daily life that we stick in is equally, you know, it's bananas on the end of a stick. In some sense. Hmm. Well, I'd like to be quite sure that you do. Um, I can suggest a way in which language tended to take this shape, uh, namely that the human species has been cursed with hands. And language tends to be a representation of a relationship between hands and the outer environment. And this breaks the outer environment into separate pieces in some way. This is one of the things that always made me so sure that porpoises do not have a language. Anything that a linguist would call a language. Because they absolutely do not have hands. Now, they do have posture, they have sound, they have a certain amount of sight, not enormously much sight. You can't see much under the sea anywhere, at best. When your vision is... In very clear water, you may see 20, 30 feet, but that takes very good water. And ordinary water, you see a foot, two feet. They have eyes, and fish have eyes. But I don't think there's really much visual image stuff. And so number of the porpoises, the ones that live in mud, are absolutely blind anyway. Um, which means that their thought processes are going to be shaped much more as representations of their body movement and their body in a medium, so to speak than the way we shape our processes in terms of a hand and, a, and an object. I would suspect. And while this, you know, leads to a certain amount of communicability, because as you know, we communicate a great deal by body positions. 
Um, it doesn't, I think. And the question is, if uh, suppose you had an L-shaped tank and two porpoises on this side of the one's limb of the L, can one porpoise say to another, there's some fish on the other limb of the L in a position not visible to either of them? And my guess is no. Well, it is, of course. Uh, but we humans are enormously wrapped up in it, especially at our more conscious levels, especially at our more interpersonal levels. Now, the very interesting things with, uh, that we keep going, thank God, uh, which is that we keep going a rather unconscious continual reading of each other's posture. Uh, which we certainly cannot usually translate into language. Uh, but sure, you know, it's enormously important to us. And the whole of our, almost the whole of our sense of the other person as being ugly or beautiful, um, loving, hating, and so forth, all of that discussion tends to be nonverbal. And, 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 and God forbid we should live without it. Yeah. I, I was going to uh, disagree with yours about about the um, dolphins and the fish. What about bees communicating where um, flower beds are? Bees that can communicate to each other where a flower bed is, which they can do by dancing. That's a communication of an object or of a relation or something. That's uh, it's made of signals which do not have immediate formal reference to that which they're talking about. And the op opposite of digital being analogic or iconic. Images or representations of magnitudes. <laughs>